for this panel. We have uh, Vince Tao, who will be coming uh, to talk to us about his work as librarian for uh, 2218. Uh, his current work involves restaging Vancouver Women's Bookstore. Um, prior to uh, moving to Vancouver, he studied in Montreal and uh, coordinated educational programming at a worker-run community. So let's all welcome Vince. Hi, so I'll try to be quick. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for um, inviting me today, and also Melissa, thank you for such a great introduction um, to today's event. And yeah, it's, I think it's always really important, even though it's worth repeating it, uh, to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral, traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples, in particular the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salatooth First Nations. Uh, it's always good to repeat it, I think. It's just a, always a time to reconsider what it means to be like a good guest, even though you may be an uninvited one. So, uh, so I'm Vincent Tao. Um, I'm going to open up my thing. So I'm Vincent Tao. I am. Um, I work at 221A, an artist-run center in Vancouver. It's on uh, 221 East Georgia, so it's in the middle of Chinatown. Uh, so I'm not trained as a librarian, so I'm very honored to be invited to this panel. Uh, very humbled as well. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to speak a little bit about the project that we have going on right now that uh, I sort of facil facilitated as the librarian there. Um, so. Oh, there you go. Space bar, okay. Uh, and yeah, so I'm just going to say that 2218 is an artist run center that's been running for about 10 years now uh, in Chinatown. Um, it has a sort of specific focus on, on the intersections of art and design, uh, and specifically in, in more recent years, it's been uh, very much focused on critical inquiry into the politics of space or how the production of space is inherently politicized. Uh, we can get into that later. Uh, so, so this, yeah, this is the project that uh, Frederick, thank you for it, uh, introducing. Uh, Rereading Room, the Vancouver Women's Bookstore. Um, just to give some like boring background information, the project was funded by the uh, BC Arts Council, specifically using funds from the um, youth engagement program grants that they offer annually. Um, and this project opened up on November 10th. Uh, we'll be closing January 13th, but we've been working on it since the summer. So uh, let's talk about this project. All right, so uh, here's, a, here's an animated gif, very, very fun, uh, of Ali, uh, or Alexander Bischoff. She's the artist I worked with for, for this project, flipping through Sue Negrin's um, A Graphic Notebook on Feminism. Uh, let's put that up there. So the, the project started um, with, actually, Alexandra was working at the Belkin Gallery at UBC, and she was doing some archival research actually here at SFU and had found this catalog that you see up here. Um, it's dated 1973. It was the, mail, the, the inaugural mail-in catalog for the Vancouver Women's Bookstore. It, it opened the same year, 1973. Um, and we flipped through it, and there's about 400 titles. Um, and each title had a small description beside it, and it was all typewritten, and it turns out all by one woman, Janine Mitchell. So we found this at the end, uh, this little, little postscript, uh, which sort of speaks to more than this being a, just like a list of books in the bookstore available by, via mail, but it really, really speaks to like the, the work, <laughs> and, and the really hard work, and the life that went into sort of selecting these books for, for the purpose of, of sharing information with other women. Right? Uh, Pretty good. <laughs> and uh, so, so the, this once we read it, we're like, there's something amazing here. There's like some, there's some sort of like mystical energy in this catalog. Um, so we embarked on like learning more about the, the the bookstore itself, and I sort of had the offhand idea. It's like let's just like recreate it or something. Um, so Alexandra was like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's grab some titles, and we selected 75 of them. Um, and she had gone off onto like a little sort of yeah, detective journey on, on finding all the original members, at least a few of them, and Janine Mitchell, who wrote that postscript. Um, and through our research, we had sort of figured out uh, a lot more about the history about the space, right? And these photographs are, are um, 
they are from one of the original members' uh, photo albums, and she was very uh, kind to just lend them to us for a bit. Um, so the history of the bookstore is that it opened in 1973, closed in 1996. Um, it was a space that was um, sort of run by volunteers, and it had gone through several relocations. It started on Richard Street, um, and it, I think it also got firebombed in 1980. And so the, the place was a community center, essentially. It was, it was all, it was mostly run by, uh, yeah, exactly. It only got to pay some of its employees, like maybe, yeah, 1985, I think. Um, but it was, it, it had sort of a special place in the community as both uh, a place to meet new friends, to meet new girlfriends, <laughs> to meet um, to meet strangers. It, it, it functioned as also sort of like a tourist destination whenever people were new to the city and wanted to, to meet other radical women, they would like obviously go to the store. Right. Um, here's another photograph. And then maybe one more. And so, what did this, this uh, bookstore mean to us, right? Uh, why did we decide to, to, to make this uh, restage? I think that's the word that we used. Uh, how, why did we decide to restage the, the bookstore in the library? Um, at least for me, it was, it was sort of a, a really important intervention into how we think about archives, right? Um, sometimes there's an alienating effect when you walk into, let's say, a bunch of rows of books and you don't know, well, there's, there's no point of reference, right? So the catalog, for, at least for me, it, it sort of uh, a lot of entryway through, through one woman's like, really hard work and, and it spoke to like, a, the life of the, the community there, the life of the, the bookstore. Um, so, you know that this this is more than just a list of books. It's actually what you know a small to probably medium sized group of women were reading in 1973. Allows it sort of like a human entryway into to, to a history of, of uh, knowledge production, and and I think it also um, was a really important intervention into how we historicize feminism. Um, I think that there's a, there's a lot of a lot of people like to think about feminism as like moving. Um, progressively through waves, right? And one wave gets better than the last, and then we sort of forget the history or sort of compartmentalize the histories uh, through, you know, the second wave was like, was like this. But I think what this this, this uh, project really spoke to was the, the fact that like, uh, feminism is more of like a, a constant conversation both with the past but always with the future. So um, maybe the, the women didn't know that, but when they were reading, they were reading for us, right? Reading for us to find us someday. Um, so uh, let's talk about the actual project. So here, here's what it looks like. Uh, it's very modest for now. Um, it opened last Thursday, I think, and uh, it was it was an amazing event. Some of the original members had reunited that night, um, and it was it was uh, they they had sort of gotten together, saw, seen each other for the first time in, in many years, and uh, we had brought them bread and roses as a, as a gift and. When they saw this, they, they began to like sing together "Bread and Roses," like the women's labor song. It's, it was like quite moving and maybe one of those like once in a lifetime things. Um, so and here's another view right there. Um, so what was really important for us is you see there, there's, there's the titles, there's 75 titles, right? But they're also sitting on the shelves, and the shelves for us are both. It's a sort of like a metaphor, but also like a I guess material support for the kind of the space itself, right? It's a space that, that allows for a certain kind of community to gather through it, around it, etc. Uh, so, uh, and here's a good quote from Kay Turner. The dream of a common language can exist with the dream of a common bookstore. Um, again, yeah, this speaks to the idea that, that, that um, the, the life of ideas, the life of, of communication needs a material support, and that, that is the library or a bookstore or something like that. Um, the catalog was, was just one part of like a, a larger network building, um, like I guess technology to, to support uh, to support women's groups, women's like, essentially like performing mutual aid and etc. Uh, and, and making connections to allies far away, right? Because it was a mail-in catalog. Um, so to get to the part about radicality. Um, this, this is, uh, again, uh, what I was really interested in was the actual space of the bookstore as more than just a bookstore, as a place for people to organize, to like secretly plot. Uh, um, and this is like an example, this is from also um, Jane's uh, archives. This is a 
protest at a daycare center that they had organized against the NDP, which had promised to do something like, you know, shoot some funding into the uh, daycares, and they did it. So um, the, the bookstore was a place for, for planning these kinds of uh, activities and, and actions. Um, and and that's, like, that's really what I really wanted to do at 221A uh, with this project, is to create the material support for that kind of uh, organizing, that kind of action. Am I running a really long time? Oh, God, okay, all right. Uh, so I'm going to try to get really quickly through this because it's really important. So this is a, an image that's sort of off topic, but uh, this is an image of the International Typographical Union. They're the first to admit uh, to, or represent women, and they're, they're particularly effective because um, they had really direct access to like print media production and distribution networks, right? Um, so, you know, they're able to produce their own types of public, public education to persuade minds and hearts. Um, and so, if you, oh, this is, we don't have time for this, but uh, to be really quick, uh, what I'm really interested in is like uh, this idea that uh, the, the, this, this guy, this French dude, the, the, the history of libraries, bookshops, printers, newspaper offices, and the radicals that lived in them, right? Um, and I'm really interested with, at least in terms of the radicality of libraries, is that they're the, it's like the material culture of, of radicalism. Um, it allows for, for you know, thought to circulate, especially at a time when there wasn't the internet. It was, it was all up to sort of the printers to like take control of their, their print shops and, and like secretly make papers and plot uh, overthrows in, in their uh, back rooms and things like that. Um, and then, just really quick, this is the other sort of stuff that we've been publishing. Um, this is a Know Your Rights Handbook. Um, and this is, again, from the same youth engagement program. We published a bunch of these along with other free pamphlets. Um, and we worked with the Legal Society, uh, the International Workers of the World, Vancouver, uh, and other sort of community organizations, Chinatown Action Group, that's doing work against displacement in Chinatown to create these free pamphlets to, to help sort of circulate um, what should be very public uh, information about how to be a good citizen or more than that. Uh, and this is uh, just a, a preview image of what the library might look like if we get our funding <laughs> at 21A. And uh, yeah, looks nice. <laughs> and it is, and thank you so much. Uh, <laughs>